Hello everyone, welcome to today's topic, electronic media, mass media, class 10, the recording industry. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history and a little bit about the technology. And I would like to remind everyone as to why we talk about the history. And that is so that we can see the future, understand the present and see the future. History does tend to repeat itself. And if we know a little bit about our history, then we should be able to predict where things are going to go, mass media and the like. So today, I would be talking to you after we took the first test, if we were in class. So you should have, or the second test, I'm sorry, you should have taken the second test by now and it's available all day long on the day that we would normally be seeing, uh, be taking the test in the class uh, syllabus and the class schedule. So please take the test first so that you don't get uh, your material conflated one test with another test. So do that first, then come back and we will dive in. Uh, this, as I said, this would be uh, this would be talked about in class after we took the first test, so it's not a real long topic, and we will get through it pretty fast. But it is a very interesting topic, and I think that the podcasts for this topic are really good ones, some of the, some of the better ones. So uh, I hope you enjoy the podcasts as well. I learn a lot from a lot of those podcasts, and they do keep us uh, really up to date. So a little bit about the history of popular music, 1877, maybe longer ago than a lot of us thought, a little further ago than I thought, really. I kind of think of records and all that from the 20th century, but uh, um, not that long after the Civil War, really. P phonographs, Thomas Edison, and they were cylindrical discs, discs, cylinders, like a, like a toilet paper roll, right, a cylinder, and uh, he is thinking, very importantly, that this will be good office equipment. Edison is an inventor, but he's also a businessman, and he is thinking about dictation devices, being able to, to uh, record uh, uh, letters and things like that for his uh, office staff. Uh, he worked tirelessly. He probably would be dictating some of this stuff in the middle of the night or very early in the morning. Uh, when he would get his ideas and so on, and uh, be frustrated when uh, secretaries and office staff weren't around to take down his his directions and things. So he's thinking office equipment, and that is important because, as we have seen and we will see, a lot of inventors don't really have a very good idea where their inventions are going to lead. Uh, the radio we've talked about radio and the and the people with radio were thinking that it would be great for ship to shore. Uh, the Titanic had sunk somewhere uh, in the early part of the 20th century, 1912, I believe it was. And for uh, the phonograph, where uh, people are thinking, or at least Edison and a few others are thinking office equipment, and we will see it a couple more times. So that's kind of a running theme in the class, that the inventors don't always know uh, how their inventions are eventually going to get uh, used and transformed by entrepreneurs. And sometimes inventors are pretty good entrepreneurs. Edison was actually pretty good at that sort of thing, but there were other people uh, that were much better. George Westinghouse and people like that were much better on the entrepreneurial side of things. So way back, 1870s. And another thing we might uh, think about is that uh, movies, Edison worked on moving pictures, motion pictures, uh, in the 1890s, and they didn't have sound until the 1920s, 1927. So there is a, a, we have these two separate inventions, one for moving pictures, one for recording sound, but they don't really get combined. They actually, they, they only get combined for a little while, uh, and then they kind of go their separate, their separate way. So uh, not long after that, uh, Emil Berliner, and he invents flat-sided, flat, two-sided 
discs, disc players, and we see a hand crank so that, that wouldn't be plugged into the wall. They wouldn't have the electricity and all that. A lot of this stuff would be hand cranked. It's mechanical. It's mechanical. And that's interesting. We tend to think of all this stuff as electronics. But uh, early uh, uh, movies and uh, phonograph players, television actually was mechanical for a while. So a lot of this stuff it, 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 uh, is, is very odd that uh, we tend to think of uh, electricity and plugging stuff into the wall and away it goes. Uh, but uh, somewhere around the 1910s, phonographs become more popular in the family home. And from 1877, okay, that's uh, 23 years plus another 10, that's 30 plus years that it takes for phonographs to become uh, really popular. And that's another thing that we should be thinking about. How long does it take from the initial invention to when it is readily available uh, in the home. And a lot of stuff takes, especially the earlier stuff, takes quite a while uh, to get uh, uh, into that mass production, economies of scale, and all that sort of thing. And then uh, uh, items to play on it too. He's got the record player, okay, he's got the, he's got the phonograph or the record player, but Somebody else is going to have to come along and put music or talking or something on discs that will play on these phonographs. And the same thing uh, goes with uh, all of these inventions we've been talking about. Radio, okay, we've got, that's great, we've got radio, what are you going to listen to on the radio? We've got televisions, great, who's going to broadcast television programs for us to watch on our televisions? And, of course, computers. Computers, great, they can compute, they can do all those things with numbers, but what are we going to uh, do uh, after we've done our income taxes with our computers and the internet? So uh, the device and what we do with the device, the stuff to, 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 to play on the device, are uh, not always in sync. Usually the device comes along first and then all the material uh, to uh, listen to or watch or or search uh, comes along from other people uh, many years later. So uh, the unintended consequence of all this, and I, I think most uh, inventions have unintended consequences. We could be talking about airplanes, we could be talking about automobiles, we could be talking about computers. There's always something that was not intended and People are going to be very happy with the new inventions, but maybe not so much um, with uh, what is being lost. Uh, for instance, with automobiles, uh, people pretty much stop riding horses for transportation as often as they had. Uh, horses are a little bit more recreational and not so much as a use after cars come into being. So there's lots of examples of things like that. And so for the phonograph, most people could would make their own music. Uh, the piano was a very popular item in many middle class homes. Uh, somebody in the family would learn to play the piano. Often it would probably be uh, the young ladies in the family. Uh, maybe the boys were out on the farm. I don't know exactly, but I, uh, from documentaries and things, I know that uh, a lot of the people in the family that would learn to play the piano would be uh, uh, passed down from mom to the daughters. And being able to read music is a wonderful thing. And to be able to play a musical instrument, it's really a wonderful thing. And with, uh, with uh, recorded music, a lot fewer people are going to learn how to play musical instruments and learn how to read music and all that. So that's kind of an unintended consequence. And it's really too bad we're not, for the most part, making our own music. So, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, the, elect the electric microphone uh, comes in in the 1920s, and we have uh, radio, and we have records, and movies, talkies, for the movies, 1927 for talking movies. Uh, the way um, uh, recording is done, you actually can record singing and sounds and all that onto a record without a microphone. Uh, you would talk into 
uh, like a horn, or something like this, right? You talk into a horn, and it would cut that groove in the record, and you could play it back. So the original records were mechanical; they weren't they weren't electronic. Seems really odd. Uh, so I'm I'm a little bit out of order here, but the Radio Corporation of America (RCA) they're they're still around, although they, I don't think they refer to the radio part anymore. They were formed to sell radios. And as we talked about uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, radio, um, that is where the radio networks uh, got formed. RCA formed the first two radio networks, NBC Blue and NBC Red. And radio and uh, phonographs and music, they're pretty closely uh, intertwined. And that's why I bring up RCA and radio along with phonographs and records and all that. They're, they're, they're pretty close together. Uh, so uh, eventually records will be played on the radio, but not for the first um, maybe 20 years or so. Not really until we get uh, certainly a better quality of uh, record. And then the other thing we talked about with radio was that musicians were reluctant to allow their performances to be recorded because then they might not be hired anymore. Okay, if I, if I have this great song and I record it, then who needs to hire me anymore? So they were smart enough to figure that one out and um, they, uh, and unions and lawyers and all those people um, really put the brakes on playing records on the radio for probably the first uh, 20 years or so. But once television came in, it really seemed like kind of a natural thing that that uh, records would be played on the radio. So, Radio Cor Corporation of America, corporation, it's hard to say, and uh, electric microphones in uh, the 1920s, pretty early. In the 1920s, we also get our first million selling record, and we get the rise of jazz, so they, they are uh, in tandem, jazz and recording. They, they come along uh, together quite nicely. Uh, it, it is seen as a, li seen as a little bit of uh, sort of dangerous, like nice kids, nice families uh, wouldn't play or listen to jazz. Um, I think, I'm sure, actually, that race would come in to the issue, just like rock and roll. Uh, nice white middle class families would be thinking that jazz is coming from African Americans, and maybe that reason alone would be a reason why people should stay away from jazz. Um, there were plenty of white jazz musicians, that's for sure. And the other part of the problem for people is that. Uh, it's got that rhythm that gets you sort of rocking and swaying. It's kind of suggestive, uh, uh, swiveling your hips and so on back and forth, dancing uh, together when you have music like this, with syncopated music like this, people uh, of opposite sexes dancing together, holding each other maybe kind of close, and um, a lot of um, uh, conservative religious type people would find that to be a problem. Uh, so, um, jazz and, like I said, rock and roll and uh, even more recently hip-hop is going to be frowned upon by older and middle-class uh, people for a while until it gets kind of mainstreamed. Um, and it, it, takes, it takes a while for a lot of that stuff to get mainstreamed. So, technology, RCA uh, merges with the company uh, Victor Company, the Victor Recording Company, and they introduced the Victrola, and the Victrola plays records at 78 revolutions per minute, per sec, per minute, RPMs, okay, RPMs, 78 RPMs, and there will be three main speeds, so we're going to go through all those, we're going to talk about the technology, uh, 78s and the succeeding ones, and then of course we get cassettes and and CDs and all of that. So we are going to talk about the technology too. And as I said, uh, records are not played on the radio 
musicians and unions and that sort of thing. I don't want to get too deep into that, but uh, and and also the quality is not as good as live uh, productions would be today. It would be pretty much indistinguishable. But back then, uh, the recording was um, it was it was clear that it wasn't uh, that it wasn't live and not quite as good, especially in the twenties and thirties. So along with our recording history, uh, we have minority music, race music, as it was called. Later on, it becomes rhythm and blues. And uh, we get hillbilly music. It was called hillbilly music, and then it's called country and western music, and then just country music. And you might be wondering about the and western uh, but cowboy music was really, really big in the 1930s, the 20s and 30s. It was really big. Some of the biggest selling uh, records in the world were uh, cowboy songs and things like that, Western music. And we get big stars like Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and people like that. So the whole, uh, and Western, uh, it was there for a definite purpose, that's for sure. Uh, but they called it Hillbilly uh, in the beginning, um, coming out of the hills of uh, the, the uh, App Appalachians, Appalachians um, in, uh, in Tennessee and West Virginia and places like that. So it's hillbilly music into the late 40s. And uh, then finally on the charts and things, it starts getting referred to as uh, country and western. And then race music uh, from, from African Americans. And it is called race music until about that same time, until about the late 1940s, uh, when it becomes uh, rhythm and blues and then R&B. Uh, and it, uh, it stays, both of, both of these stay kind of uh, off in their own little, uh, uh, little uh, uh, ghettos, you might say. Uh, for a while until it gets, and even today, you know, there's 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 country music and uh, and hip hop and lots of lots of bifurcations and things like that. Also, we get social change. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, music is you can't really tell who's playing it, and if you're listening to some song, and uh, you can't tell are they white or are they black or whatever. And also, if you're looking for the best talent to be in your band or orchestra, uh, then race sometimes doesn't really come into play. But maybe the best drummer is African American. Maybe the best trombonist is, uh, is white. And so we start to get uh, intermixing of the races in the music. And like I said, when you're listening to it on the radio, uh, you can't often tell what the race of the people are. And that's going to come into play with, uh, with Elvis, believe it or not. 1930s, dance and big band music are really, really big. Uh, and they do help with integration. We get integrated uh, orchestras. This is uh, Benny Goodman here, and we see uh, two whites and two blacks, and Benny wanted the very best musicians he could find, and that's the way it would, that's the way it would go. There would be some nice integration there. 1939, uh, like films, and we've talked about, we've talked about movies before, uh, with Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz and a real peak in Hollywood movies in the late 30s, and same thing for uh, big band music. It is really, really big. Uh, the uh, Ken Burns documentary, we talked about Ken Burns uh, when we talked about public television, and he has a wonderful documentary on jazz, and he documents it quite well. I will link to some of that with, uh, with Ken Burns and uh, uh, as much as I can uh, link to. Uh, I'd love to play the whole episode, but uh, I think I can link to a couple of uh, nice parts of that. Uh, for big band music from the late 1930s. There were dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of bands touring the country, 
playing every Friday and Saturday night. It was really a big thing. A lot of people think maybe uh, bands and rock and roll and the Beatles and all that stuff in the 1960s, but really going back to the 1930s, uh, going out and dancing. Dancing was really a, a big thing. It's very popular, and wait till you see how these uh, young kids are dancing to big band music. I got a couple of really wonderful links to see some people uh, doing the Lindy Hop and the Jitterbug and some wonderful stuff. It's it's really uh, it's it's really uh, athletic, that's for sure, uh, and uh, practically acrobatic. Wonderful stuff. I, I love uh, the big band music. Um, I, I think a lot of people, if you're like me, you might think that uh, it, and, until rock and um, and hip hop and things like that came along, that music was a little bit staid and a little bit quiet and 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 so on. Uh, but this stuff. It really hops, uh, it, or you could say it really rocks. It's uh, it's really amazing stuff. Uh, the drummers were really talented, and everybody else. It seems a little odd uh, with uh, clarinets and things like that in a band, but uh, when you see the the crowd going crazy uh, for the dance music, you understand that it, that uh, uh, rock and um, and hip hop and all that uh, were just part of the continuum. They certainly didn't begin anything. So a little bit more technology. In the 1940s, audio tape gets brought over from Germany. Uh, it had actually been developed in Germany in the very late 1920s. They more or less kept the technology to themselves. Remember, Germany in the 1930s would have been under uh, the Nazi party, and uh, we weren't um, exchanging lots of technology and things like that. But when our troops were uh, were marching their way across Europe after the uh, after the invasion and D-Day and across uh, France and, uh, and, uh, and Belgium and Germany, they would be hearing, uh, uh, they, they had radios, they could pick stuff up. A lot of times it would be propaganda being broadcast on the radio and they'd get to uh, where the signal was coming from and they'd go into the little building and it would be empty and in the back there somewhere uh, in some kind of a control room there would be one of these uh, real to real tape players, magnetic tape recorders, tape players, uh, which could play a lot longer than a record could. Uh, uh, records at that time would have been 78s. They could only play maybe, I think it's maybe 10 uh, uh, minutes, uh, 10 or 12 minutes to a side, then you'd have to flip it over, but this reel-to-reel -reel stuff could go for um, maybe an hour, maybe longer. I'm not sure where the technology was on it in the 1940s, but reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape could play much longer. So Bing Crosby, a big star, multi-star, he was a recording star, he was a movie star, uh, he began in vaudeville, uh, he did television, uh, he and a few other people uh, were there through most of the 20th century and uh, really conquering all the all the mediums. And so he had a radio show. He liked the idea of recording his show. And if you record it on tape like this, you can edit it. It's, it's not hard to edit audio tape. I've, I've done it myself. Um, right here is where you, you put the tape in there. You take a razor blade, you'd make your splice, and uh, you'd mark on the mark on the tape there and you can take out what you didn't like. And so if Bing thought that uh, maybe the joke wasn't uh, all that funny or that maybe he could sing a song a little bit better, he liked the idea of editing his show, uh, taping it, and then when it was time for it to go out over the radio, uh, they could play that. Most radio was live, I'd, I'd say, not, well, 100% for a while, and then a very high percentage of it would be. But that's going to lead into television and videotape and uh, recording shows, possibly editing shows, all that kind of stuff. And then it's actually going to lead in to magnetic uh, computer tape. So Bing was kind of at the, at the forefront of a lot of this stuff. Now, he wasn't an inventor. But he was an investor, and he and he put a lot of money into it, and did pretty well on his uh, Ampex and um, 
MPEX and tape players and videotape and all that. So 1948 we get the LP as they're popular, popularly known as the LP. It's 33 and a third, yes, and a third revolutions per minute, RPMs. Uh, they play longer, so they were popularly called LPs. And that is uh, what most rock went through, uh, Sgt. Pepper and all that kind of stuff, and Tommy and The Who and, and Michael Jackson and, uh, and Print, all that. They would have been on LPs. Um, and I have to say, I kind of miss LPs, not the fact that you had to pick up the, the, the needle and play different songs and flip it over and all that, uh, but what I miss is the the jacket that the LP comes in is uh, like like the LP, 10 inches. And so there'd be lots of nice booklets and uh, the lyrics to the to the music and uh, uh, groups like the Beatles uh, could have very nice uh, uh, jackets with, uh, like I say, with pages and pages to look at. Uh, and uh, all the lyrics to their songs and little uh, posters. Sometimes you could pull out a poster out of the White Album and hang it on your, your college dorm wall and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't really get that so much with CDs because they're so much smaller and certainly don't get any of it with streaming. And so uh, I don't necessarily miss the technology, but I kind of miss the art. I, I, the art of, uh, of LPs was really quite nice. And uh, I used to work in a record store um, back, back, in the, back in the day. And um, it was kind of a cool job to have, I have to say. <laughs> uh, young, right out of college and working in a record store, uh, being a record store manager and all that. It was a, it was a pretty good job to have. Um, and uh, all the wonderful art. Matter of fact, there were books on album cover art and things like that. So um, I kind of... Kind of miss it, kind of don't, really. I love streaming, and I love CDs and everything, but anyway. Also, other technology, the single, and that plays at 45 RPMs, and those are called 45s, popular. They are called 45s, or they were called um, singles. And um, so LPs, 45s, and 78s. Those were the those are the terms that people call them, popular terms that people call them. So these would be singles, about five minutes on a side. So if you wanted to buy uh, that latest single, okay, whether it was whether it was Michael Jackson beat it or whether it was the Beatles, I want to hold your hand. Uh, you'd be buying a 45, and there would be two songs on it, one on each side. Uh, that sort of the A side and the B side, and the record company would decide which side they thought should be played on the radio, and they would tell all the radio stations and all the DJs uh, that were releasing, uh, you know, here's the Beatles' new, new single, Hey Jude. Uh, every once in a while, the B side would be kind of the popular one. I think the Beatles had, and the Beatles were so popular, they almost most sides would get played, Paperback Writer, and Rain and things like that, and Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. I think we're on opposite sides of each other. And um, sometimes one would, the B side would outsell the other side. Anyway, uh, 45s, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of fun. I have to say, I think uh, LPs are, are a little bit better of a way to go. Uh, and that's just a personal, uh, a personal preference. Today, because of streaming, it's a lot more about singles and the art of the album, and Beyonce certainly proved that with Lemonade. But the art of the album is really is really quite nice. You get a whole thematic working of uh, maybe six or eight or ten or twelve uh, songs all working together. And uh, in the '60s and '70s, of course, the Beatles with Sgt. Pepper and uh, and uh, rock operas like uh, The Who's Tommy and things like that, and Pink Floyd, uh, The Wall. Um, you get a whole uh, combined work. And uh, these days, I know artists uh, 
uh, drop uh, uh, albums, but because of streaming, I think a lot of people don't really get to hear the album uh, with all of the cuts in a particular order. And so um, that's too bad also. Uh, a lot of times on albums, of course, there'd be a lot of filler, and you buy an album uh, full of uh, those 10 songs or so, and you'd end up playing maybe three of them. Uh, so, sure, singles are a nice way to go, streaming, all that. Uh, but with some some works, uh, the whole the whole uh, the whole album is really kind of nice. Now you might be wondering about this red thing right here, and that is RCA's effort to thwart CBS, which was one of the other popular uh, record companies, and so they put out these uh, uh, turntables and uh, 45s that had a larger hole in there uh, as opposed to the uh, small one. And that's really, that's all you need. There's no real reason why uh, they would do that, but they did that just because their product wouldn't play on the, on the competition. It's almost like uh, Macs and PCs or something like that. It's really, it's really stupid, I have to say. Um, and the fix, it was a pretty easy fix. It's, it's, it's almost comical how easy of a fix it was. Yeah, just a little plastic insert. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just a little plastic insert. I don't know what CBS was thinking about, but they were, they were kind of mean that way. And if you were a young kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, maybe you'd have a little portable uh, player there, and it, you have a handle and a cord, and you could uh, snap the arm in there and go to your friend's house after school and play music. Of course, the speakers are only about that big, so you don't get a very good sound system, that's for sure. Um, and I guess there's another, there's 16, I don't know exactly what played 16s, maybe spoken word uh, stuff. I remember when I was a little kid, I had some spoken word story uh, records, and I'm guessing that that's what, that was spoken word stuff. But I've seen uh, record players with 78 and 45 and 33. Uh, but the 16, I think, was for spoken word. I'll have to, have to check on that. Another wonderful way to play music was through a jukebox and big speakers, okay? So you could get a pretty good sound, fill up the whole bar or restaurant, and you could hear what you wanted to hear. You didn't have to hear what the DJs or the radio stations or the record companies wanted you to hear. You could, you could uh, play what you wanted to play. Um, I'm sure the price went up over the years. It might have started at, 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 at 10 cents or a quarter or something like that. I don't know. And maybe it might get two or three plays, uh, three songs for a quarter, maybe something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but you do get to see what is popular. So if you are a radio station or a record company, then you can find out, wow, this song is getting lots of play on jukeboxes. Now, one of the odd things about jukeboxes is that it's all cash. You, you put your 10 cents or quarter in the slot and you play, uh, you, you play the, the cut that you want to hear. Here's a, another idea there. So if you wanted to play uh, whatever, so if it's not you play, you want to play, well, I can't read that very well, A26, so you'd hit A and then 26, and it would, you know, put your money in and it would actually play what you wanted to play. But because it was an all cash business, uh, it seems kind of it seems kind of obvious at this point, but the 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 mafia got heavily involved in it. Uh, it's so easy to skim uh, cash uh, now that everything is is digital and cards and all that. It's a lot harder to just sort of skim uh, money like that. I'm sure they found other wonderful ways, cash only type businesses, things like that. But uh, for a while, in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s, the the mob was heavily involved in the jukebox business, and they would tell restaurant owners and bars, uh, you, here's your new jukebox, <laughs> throw the other one in the river, whatever. But uh, 
uh, you're going to use hours, right? And, and it's nice and it's a wonderful thing and you can hear wonderful music and all that. But, uh, you know, the guy that comes to collect, he's going to be skimming some money and not giving it to the, to the uh, record companies and the artists who are supposed to be getting residuals. In the 1950s, Alan Freed, disc jockey, as they were called, DJs, and he names the mu new music rock and roll. The, he probably wasn't the one that came up with the term. He probably heard it somewhere, uh, but he was very early into rock. He loved it, and it certainly didn't bother him that a lot of the musicians, uh, like a Little Richard and Chuck Berry, were black, uh, and that was going to trouble a lot of people. Uh, the whole idea that uh, they're, they're, uh, what they're hearing on the radio, that radio was going to be integrated, believe it or not, right? Radio is going to be integrated. White music and black music are going to be played on the same radio station. It's really hard to, to segregate music. And even though a lot of people would like to have done that, uh, sadly enough. Uh, rock and roll actually has kind of a rather unsavory uh, origins, rocking and rolling, is kind of what happens when uh, sex is going on, and uh, so um, a lot of people, even the even the term rock and roll, was uh, not something that they wanted to hear. That's for sure. It's sort of shortened to rock these days. Uh, but uh, he, in the early 1950s, somewhere around uh, 54 or so, out of Cleveland, which is why the Rock and Roll Museum is in Cleveland, he would be playing this music and with uh, with quite a large reach, I don't know, 100,000 watts or something like that. You could probably hear it over 25% of the country. And rock music did uh, divide listeners by age, uh, especially the loud stuff, not the not, not the nice ballads and things like that, but the but the Elvis stuff and and uh, and then the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, all that stuff that's supposed to be played really loud uh, would be very troublesome for older people. So rock was divisive, sadly enough. Oftentimes, white artists would recognize for sure, hey, that's a good song, that's a great song. And Chuck Berry is black, and maybe some people don't want to hear that, so they will do a, a cover. They will do a cover. And Little Richard, Tutti Frutti was covered. A lot of his stuff was covered. His stuff was just a little bit too, uh, too uh, raucous, a little bit too wild, a little bit too much um, uh, innuendo and all of that. So back in the 50s, often times white artists would cover black music. So... Um, if they were the composers, then they should still be have been getting residuals and things, but there are lots and lots of stories of young blues players coming out of the Mississippi Delta writing classic stuff, um, Robert Johnson in particular, and then unscrupulous uh, agents and people like that coming through and saying, well, I'll buy that song for $50. And if you're a poor sharecropper, and you don't have very much money, $50 sounds like an awful lot of money for a song that you wrote. And so, uh, sadly, a lot of people, like Robert Johnson, who wrote so much great stuff, they got turned into rock by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. And, and uh, Chuck Berry and people like that, a lot of times they were taken advantage of um, by um, record companies and agents and people like that. Nineteen fifty-eight, nineteen fifty-nine. Kind of an interesting story. It's a little bit of a side point, but uh, what the heck? Rock and roll, which had such a great start in fifty-five, fifty-six, with Elvis and Chuck Berry and Little Richard and and uh, and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lewis, all these great guys doing this wonderful rock music. It was very, very popular. And it was very big, and and all the kids and teenagers and everybody was just going crazy for it. And within about a two-year period, it almost dies off. So uh, here's, uh, here's the story of Rock's near-death experience. Elvis, there he is. Uh, in his wild days, he's got the long sideburns and all of that. 
Um, and he gets drafted into the army, off to Europe he goes, to Germany, where he meets his bride-to-be Priscilla. Buddy Holly uh, and the crickets, but Buddy Holly dies in a plane crash, and he is kind of the prototype for the rock band. He's writing the music. Uh, they've got, uh, instead of a bass guitar, it's a... a, a stand-up bass, bass fiddle, I think, uh, drums, maybe another guitar, and that's kind of what uh, rock music is going to look like uh, going forward. Uh, and he dies in an airplane crash, and that's quite shocking. Chuck Berry, uh, really, the, really the father, grandfather of rock, uh, so many uh, great songs that he wrote as well, and he goes to prison for tax problems. Now, I don't think he's in prison for very long, but again, it's another case of bad management, and not paying the people that you trust to pay your taxes and all that kind of stuff. And he wrote just so many uh, classic songs back there. And he was, a, he was a, a writer and a musician. Elvis didn't really write his own music, but, uh, but Chuck Berry wrote so many classic rock songs that uh, were... Uh, recorded by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all sorts of other people. Um, Roll Over Beethoven and Sweet Little Sixteen and school, uh, uh, School's Out, all that kind of stuff. He wrote tons and tons of great stuff. And so he's having problems. Off to prison he goes. Little Richard, Richard Penniman. He leaves rock for religion. He is truly a wild man. Uh, the big high pompadour, and he starts getting very uh, flashy and loud and all that kind of stuff with his, with his clothing and all that. And, and interestingly, he, uh, his instrument is the piano. And the same thing is going to be true for Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, these guys are going to play the piano and, and be the lead, and be the lead. So that's kind of unusual. Usually the, the keyboard is kind of off to the side and out front is... is uh, uh, you know, the, the, the main singer uh, standing at the microphone, all that, maybe playing, uh, maybe playing a guitar, but oftentimes like Mick Jagger, just uh, standing up front and singing and dancing and all that. But uh, Little Richard and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, they, they played the piano. Oftentimes they'd be standing up and uh, going crazy. Here's, uh, here's Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, really, these guys were, were crazy performers. Uh, if you get a chance, just go on YouTube and look for some of these performances. I didn't want to link to all this stuff. If, you, if you're not into it, that's fine. But uh, it's really a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun to look at uh, this, this, early, uh, this early rock music. I do have a nice link to uh, Rock and Roll Early Days documentary. So you'll see some of these guys, but maybe that'll uh, send you down the rabbit hole and you can start wandering around in uh, YouTube and looking for some other stuff. Anyway, Cherry Lee Lewis marries his underage cousin. I think she's like 13 or 14. So he's kind of on the outs. Now, it was legal uh, wherever he was, Tennessee or something. Um, and it was uh, per perfectly legal, but um, a lot of people took it the wrong way. Or maybe the right way. But uh, anyway, he uh, was on the outs for his behavior as well. And Alan Freed, the the uh, promoter and disc jockey, and he had some legal problems with payola, and that's pay to play, and a lot of DJs were very young and not being paid a whole lot, really kids out of high school, and you get a stack of 45s and, and two turntables and a microphone, as the song goes, two turntables and a microphone, and that's pretty, pretty cheap, and uh, you could pay these guys not much more than minimum wage, really, and especially at small radio stations throughout the country. And so if somebody comes along and says, hey, will you play this record a, a, a couple of extra times per day? Just a couple of extra times. If you're going to play it three times a day, play it five times a day, right? Just play it a few extra times per day. And when people listen to the radio, they often think that, the DJ is playing something, it must be good. And hey, I kind of like that. Sometimes repetition kind of 
uh, breeds this familiarity and, and it does show that if you hear something on the radio often enough, you'll think that must be pretty good. Why are they playing it on the radio so much? And, uh, and it does show that it can increase record sales. So uh, sometimes they would get um, maybe a set of tires for their car, uh, maybe um, dinner at some nice restaurants, stuff like that. Uh, pay to play or payola still goes on today. Uh, the stakes are much higher. Uh, they might get uh, tickets to the Super Bowl or something like that, uh, or, or uh, uh, various concerts and things like that. Um, but um, still today, pay to play is a round payola. And so Alan Freed also out for a little while. And so this is all happening between 58, 59, and it looks like Rock is kind of kind of going to be gone. When Elvis comes out of the army, he's not quite as Rock as he was when he went in. He starts making movies that are pretty much G-rated romantic comedy type movies, a lot more ballads and uh, romance and love songs and things like that, and not nearly so much Rock. And uh, the other people are either in prison uh, or dead, and so when the Beatles started uh, a appearing in, uh, in England in uh, 62 and 63, it was really kind of the resurrection of rock. And of course the Beatles loved American music and so they're kind of bringing American music back to America. Okay, while all this is going on, in Detroit, the Motor City, Motown, right, because that's where the cars are made, we have the first black label. And they are going to make in, inroads into the mainstream. Like I said, th there, they were, uh, there was a kind of segregation going on with the R&B charts, as they were called. But to get played on the main uh, top pop charts was hard to break in. Mostly they were going to be white artists. And, uh, you know, the, the hillbillies could be over on the, on the hillbilly charts and the hillbilly radio stations and the country and western radio stations and all that. Uh, black artists could be uh, in R&B, okay, rhythm and blues, all that. Um, but play, getting played on the main uh, stations was hard to break through, and Barry Gordy managed to do that. And lots and lots of top ten singles. Don't worry about writing down this list. Uh, I'm certainly not going to ask, you know, which of these is on the list and which wasn't or anything like that. But it, I just put it up there because it's so impressive, and there it says right there, not on the test, but it's so impressive, you probably have heard of most of these uh, uh, groups or acts, uh, really, and um, that's really amazing that it, it really came out of Detroit. He had a house and turned it into a recording studio, and young kids, Diana Ross, people like that, could, could just like walk over, or ride the bus over, these poor young uh, African American Detroit kids could uh, they they'd hear hey if you got something go over there Barry Gordy's place and give them an audition and uh, so they did and quite a lot of really top talent that's for sure I'm from Michigan I got to hear a lot of Motown I didn't grow up in Detroit I was in a little small farm town uh, about 100 miles north of Detroit but even up there we got to hear lots and lots of Motown music. And I get it. I moved to California when I got out of school. Winters are pretty tough in Michigan. But when Barry Gordy moved his operations from out of Detroit to uh, Los Angeles, Beverly Hills area, something like that, I think they lost a lot of the connection they had. I, I think that's part of, the, part of what hurt Motown, and they ended up sort of fading away, really. Now they're, they're around mostly in terms of, of uh, compilations and things like that. Look at all the great stuff we used to do, but uh, I don't think Motown is a record company people talk about in the present tense so much anymore. So a little bit more technology. We get transistors, and we'll talk about this when we get into computers. The transistor is much smaller than tubes, and radios are uh, run on tubes for the most part. All those great classic radios in the pictures we saw of radios from the 1930s, that, that golden age of radio. Now with transistors, it's portable. 
I had I had one that looked exactly like that, exactly like that. They must have been really popular. And you could take this and put it over the handlebars of your bike and go riding around. So before there were uh, phones uh, and uh, and iPods and and uh, cassette players and all that, you could take your radio. Okay, couldn't play couldn't play the music. You'd have to listen to the radio there, but still it was portable. That's important. It was portable, and you could go riding around and listen to the music on your bike or at the beach or wherever you wanted to go. So, 1964, the Beatles appear on Ed Sullivan. That is the beginning of the British invasion. Uh, this is a pretty long story. There are whole classes on the history of rock and roll. That would be a whole semester. We're kind of zipping through it pretty darn fast, so I apologize for that. But there's lots of stuff on YouTube that if you're interested in any of this stuff, right? Just dive into YouTube. You can find lots of uh, nice examples and documentaries on all this stuff. So that is kind of the resurrection of rock from its near-death experience of the late 1950s. Uh, and Bob Dylan and the Beatles were the leaders in the composer uh, artist. And Buddy Holly did that too, and so did Chuck Berry, but uh, when the Beatles did it, it really went for uh, everybody decided they had to do it. All of a sudden, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and everybody uh, is going to start writing their own music. Lots of people thought that the great old music uh, from uh, from Robert Johnson and all the blues and all that, that's how the Rolling Stones uh, began. That's how Led Zeppelin began, playing this great old American blues music uh, with kind of a rock beat. But when the Beatles exploded, really then everybody decided that they needed to uh, write their own music and play their own music, and, and Dylan, too. Those, those two that really kicked that off. We get social influences. We talked about that a bit with movies and this whole 1960s era with uh, the Vietnam War and the draft and drugs and fashion and civil rights. We talked about that in more detail back when we were talking about movies. But it certainly uh, was intertwined with uh, with music. That was a, that was a big part of that of that era, uh, uh, along with the along with the trippy drugs, marijuana, LSD. You got the trippy music of of Sgt. Pepper and uh, and uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and all that kind of stuff. It all really uh, was uh, part of the same cloth. Woodstock, 1969, and the rise of FM radio and album rock, and throughout all of the, all of the Elvis and the early years of the Beatles and all that kind of stuff, people are listening to this stuff on those little, those little radios, and it's always about AM radio. And part of the problem for FM was that stations were allowed to simulcast the same thing on AM and FM. So in order to save money, why hire more DJs and buy more music and all that kind of stuff? Just put the same thing out on both, on both uh, uh, stations there. And then the uh, FCC stepped in and said, no, no, uh, let's, let's cut that out. And you need a whole, you, if you're going to have, uh, if you own both those stations, you can't just do um, the same on both. And then with the Beatles, coming out with uh, albums that maybe told a whole story. We talked about that uh, with Sgt. Pepper. Then uh, uh, FM stations could play the whole album a lot of times, or all of Tommy, all of the whole rock opera, that sort of thing, from start to finish. They just put it on, maybe break once for a commercial, and play straight on through. So that's the, the rise of album rock. Sadly, album rock is kind of gone, but uh, there's album rock. And Woodstock, August 1969. And that looks like uh, John Sebastian to me. Yep. Cassette tapes are introduced in 1963. It takes them a while, I would say a good 10 years, to really become popular. Yeah, at least 10 years, maybe 12 or 14, 15 years to really become popular. But cassette tape is introduced. There's an old, uh, sort of a, uh, uh, how, 
how do you fix a broken cassette tape? And old old timers like me and a lot of your professors say, well, with a pencil. And young people would say, well, how do you fix a cassette tape with a pencil? And so if anybody's ever said that to you, if you've ever seen it on the internet, generally what happens is tape starts getting unspooled. You get a whole spaghetti full of the tape as it gets on, uh, uh, gets out of the cassette there, and you simply stick the pencil in there or your finger or whatever, and you can wind it back in up the into the take up reel. So uh, that's how you fix a cassette tape with a pencil. And we've been talking about making music portable from the transistor radio. And there we have the very popular, very popular Sony Walkman headphones. And uh, what a great picture that is. I just love that picture, the, the 1970s and 80s shorty shorts, roller skates, all that. It's, uh, I found it on, on uh, Google Image, but uh, that's such a wonderful, that's such a wonderful image there. Portable music. Also, around that same time in the 1970s, we get the eight-track tape. Sometimes if you only hear it, it sounds like A, like ABC, like A-track tape, but it's eight tracks. And the idea is, is that you can get to songs and navigate to different songs if there are eight tracks rather than just two sides of the cassette. So as you're driving around in your car or, or skating around with your, with your Walkman and you want to get to another song, you have to fast forward or rewind. That's the wonderful thing about cassettes, right? You just go to wherever you want to go. But uh, if you had a, that's the wonderful thing about CDs. That's the wonderful thing about CDs is you can just punch in where you want to go. But with uh, uh, cassettes and A-tracks, there's, there's fast forwarding and rewinding and flipping it over from one side to the other and all that. And the 8-track was supposed to help you get to songs around the album uh, a lot faster. It's bigger, uh, at least maybe three times as big as the cassette tape. Uh, it's hard to tell. I don't, I don't have a picture of them side by side, but it's quite a bit bigger than cassette tape. The problem is uh, you can't just stick uh, your pencil in there and wind it back up when it gets unspooled all over the place. Basically, you're going to have to just throw your throw your 8-track out. It, it was spooled in a very odd way, and I don't think it was a very good technology. Um, but I sure sold a lot of them uh, when I worked at the record store back, back then, back in the day. And the boombox from the 1980s. And we see this one is playing a cassette. Uh, also, you can play the radio. Uh, I suppose they made them that could play eight tracks, although I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like, I, I'm not even sure they did that. But uh, big speakers, you can really blast out that sound. The downside is, is you need like 150 uh, D batteries, not 150, but a lot of D batteries in order to blast out that sound. And so you, you almost are thinking one that size, put it on wheels or something like that, because they're pretty big. Uh, but you really could blast out the sound. Uh, technology over the years has gotten quite good. You can get a pretty good sound out of those little, uh, as you well know, out of uh, those uh, home speakers and things like that. Uh, Bose uh, radios and speakers and all that kind of stuff. But uh, back then, uh, if you wanted to really blast it out, then a boombox was the way to go. And yes, you could plug them into the wall uh, or an outlet, but if you wanted to be portable, then you really needed uh, whole, whole wheelbarrows full of, uh, of D batteries. So, uh, the 8-track tape, 1974, hip-hop comes out of the inner cities in the late 70s, and that is always surprising every time I see that, because I think a lot of people are thinking of hip-hop in maybe the late 80s and the 90s, but it was uh, quite a bit earlier than that. Uh, the late 70s, New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, the outer boroughs, as they're called, 1983, 
we get CDs. And again, I, I think most people are thinking CDs of the 90s. And that would have been earlier, not very many, uh, not much music would have been available on CDs. Remember, just because you've got the new technology of the cassette tape or the 8-track tape or the CD, is there anything to buy on that new technology? And it's going to take the uh, record companies, they're still called record companies, it's going to take the record companies a few years to start putting out product on that new technology. So CDs, again, uh, 1983, it's a Dutch uh, invention in this case. And I think a lot of people, it's more like 88, 89, 90 before they're starting to get CD uh, players and things. And the price is going to be kind of high, uh, just like we've talked about before with, with uh, economies of scale and so on. The, the first flat screen TVs of, uh, of uh, 10 or 15 years ago were thousands of dollars. Now they're down to hundreds of dollars. Uh, and CD players would have been hundreds of dollars back in the late 80s and early 90s. And that price is going to have to drop too. So a lot of this technology, remember, the price is going to be like a new technology price. Uh, you might think of like a uh, 3D television or um, yeah, the, the, the highest end flat screen TVs today can be three and four thousand dollars too with the with the, the highest refresh rate and biggest screen and and uh, curved screen and all that wonderful kind of stuff so uh, yeah the the price for that has dropped quite a bit but uh, when it first came out it would have been pretty expensive technology that never really uh, well no I'm sorry mp3 digital music format is introduced in 98 and so on your on your uh, uh, iPods and things like that, MP3, digital music, late 90s. Just a little over 20 years. Here's a big, this big player there with all this stuff. Philips, part of all that. And speaking of, here we have the uh, iPod, iTunes, introduced by Apple, Napster. So all this digital technology is going to open up a big can of worms and a big unintended consequence. People are thinking this is great and you don't have to flip it over and it's portable and all that. A lot of wonderful stuff with this digital technology, but the unintended consequence and the downside is they are files and they can be copied and that can be a problem and shared and all of that. So Napster introduced, record companies swarmed all over it pretty darn fast. It was shut down. But for a while, file sharing was really a big problem. Until streaming came along, file sharing was a big problem. It was mitigated quite a bit by Steve Jobs and Apple. A lot of people don't necessarily want to break the law. But if that's the easiest way to go, then okay, here's, here's uh, oh, look, my friend, he's got, uh, he's going to give me his new album. And if it is nice and easy to download or to purchase, then why not, right? And really, musicians need money too. I mean, I know a lot of us are on a budget, but musicians do like to get paid. And so when iPods and iTunes and all that stuff came along from Apple, then it could increase payment to uh, those uh, poor starving musicians. So that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing when artists get paid. So Sirius and XM, they come out, they merge, satellite radio, services begin. Um, I think satellite radio is it's kind of been taken over, I think, really by, by streaming. Um, but, uh, but for a while, if you had a, a nice car and satellite radio and some cars came with uh, automatic, uh, uh, the, the system already installed in your car and that sort of thing, then, then, uh, then you could get hours and hours and hours of Elvis or the Beatles or Dylan or whatever. 
And speaking of cars, I want to, uh, there's an interesting point that cars are a real, um, uh, it's a good way to find out what's popular in uh, music and technology. And if we go all the way back to the 1930s, uh, luxury cars, usually, it would be more expensive cars, would start installing radios right in the car. Oh, how wonderful. I can listen to the radio in my car. And so radios would be in cars for years and years. And then somewhere maybe in the 1960s, FM radios would be installed in cars, AM, FM. So if you've got a, a nice car, right, if you've got a Cadillac or a Lincoln or something like that, then you'd have AM, FM radio built right into your car. And then with some of the other new technology like cassettes, there was a big aftermarket of installing cassette players in cars and the speakers, right? You didn't want your, your nice sound coming out of that tiny little three-inch speaker right there in your dashboard. So it would be companies like Best Buy. It wasn't Best Buy back then, but companies like Best Buy, you could take your car in and they would put in some speakers in your door and uh, back there by the back window and maybe uh, on the dashboard and all over. And it was a uh, good way for a lot of young people. I had a lot of friends that uh, they could run the wires somehow, figure out how to run the wires up and into the door and, and put the speakers in and all that kind of stuff. And so that was a, a pretty big thing, turning your car into a really nice sound system. And then, of course, uh, the, the nicer cars at first, okay, the Cadillacs and whatever and the Mercedes and all that would have a very nice sound system. I think most cars today have pretty good sound systems and they can take uh, they can take digital technology and all that. But a lot of that stuff starts off in nicer cars. It's a, it's a, a way to sell more, really. Look, here's a, here's a car with AM, FM radio. Here's a car with a built-in cassette player and all that sort of thing. Uh, there were ways that you could buy a tiny little portable uh, CD player and there would be a sort of like a fake cassette and you put the cassette into your cassette slot in your car and I guess it faked out the car but then you could play CDs through your cassette player. So I had one of those for a little while. It was kind of interesting. Um, that technology, in other as long as we're talking about cars and so on, that technology could cost a chunk of money and so a lot of times cars would be broken into and the sound system would be stolen. And uh, that was a, a big thing. You might, a couple hundred dollars, you know, and if we adjust for inflation, maybe two, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars worth of sound for your CD or your cassette system and all that kind of stuff and you get a smash and grab, right? Break the window, go in and uh, and unscrew that uh, new cassette player that's right there, screwed to the bottom of your uh, 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 front there of your car. And uh, that happened to me once. Um, smashed, I think I scared him away because the wires were all sort of hanging there, but he or she didn't actually steal my uh, cassette player. Anyway. Streaming is the thing, as you well know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Sadly, though, what you might not know is artists hardly get paid anything for streaming. And this figure is a few years old, but it's pretty close that Pharrell Williams could have 40 plus million streams on Pandora and only make a few thousand dollars. So artists just can't make much money off of physical sales anymore. Even even uh, the, 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 the Taylors and Beyonce's and so on, who actually still can manage to sell uh, physical uh, uh, music. People still download the whole album or maybe even buy the CD or something like that. But uh, it's a rough world out there these days for musicians. I think it's harder than it was uh, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s uh, to make any money as a musician. So, in a 10-year period, 
music sales fall 50%. And that's kind of important. Don't worry about all the, all the numbers and everything, but 50% is a lot for sales to fall. Um, now, things are kind of going full circle, and LPs are back on the market and things like that. It's still a streaming world, that's for sure, but it's hard to make much money as a musician in the streaming world. And I'm not a musician. I know musicians. I have friends who are musicians. And I like to support the arts. I really do. And so I will buy. I have enough disposable income, not tons, but I will still buy CDs and things. And uh, I like to uh, help out. I don't always like to file share and, 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 and so on and, 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 uh, and stream. Uh, this is a pretty good chart. Um, it's a little complicated, but if you take just a little while to see, here's LPs. And so LPs in the 70s, they're going to sort of peak in the late 70s, and then they're going to drop. And I think at some point, they're going to come back a little bit. Okay, and this is probably four years old, and LPs are starting to come back a bit. Uh, vinyl singles, okay, not much in that range. Uh, eight tracks are going to get pretty big, and then they're going to uh, die. I'm sorry, eight tracks and cassettes, right? So they're going to sort of be gone here uh, pretty fast. Other kinds of tapes and that sort of thing. It's sort of the rise and fall, and maybe rise again. Who knows? Sound exchange, paid subscriptions. There's a lot in there, uh, but we see. Uh, kind of the big picture, I think. You can sort of see the big picture. You see that one's CDs. That's CDs. So in the 90s, CDs are really the big thing. 2000s, and we see a steep decline in CDs too. 75% 75, 75 total music industry revenue from streaming. Uh, that's a couple years ago. Probably a little bit higher than that now. Vinyl is outselling CDs, so that's kind of interesting to go into various stores. They don't really have too many record stores around anymore, but you'll find some stores, clothing stores. I even found found some in a in a, a, a clothing store that had a record rack. Bookstores also, Barnes and Noble have uh, music sections, and that does this old record store clerks, managers, heart, good. Really does. So there's a lot of technology and th the main takeaway, I think, is that you can't stop it, you can't stop progress, you can't stop the future, and don't think that you, we, are in any sort of a perfect place. All the technology, all of the, the formats, and all that sort of stuff is going to change. I have had my record collection, and then, uh, and then CDs, and, and cassettes, and transferred those, and digitized them. And even with computers and things, there's lots of technologies, and flash drives, and this and that and the other. There's a book there. I love that. Okay. And some of this is, is computer-based. Uh, zip disks and things like that. But the point is, we are not done. We are not done by a long shot. Technology will continue to change, and at a certain point, everything you own will be out of date. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest upside to streaming, is the streaming will take care of the technology, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the downside for streaming is that you don't really own it. And... Um, I kind of grew up on owning, having a nice record collection. I had hundreds of LPs at one point. And the thing about owning records and owning CDs is you can sell them. And I have made hundreds and hundreds of dollars selling my old records and selling my old CDs and things when I was done with them. And if you have files and things like that, or even just uh, an iTunes download, you can't really sell them. So maybe that's a small thing for you, but uh, the idea of sort of recycling and selling it and, and so on is uh, it's a nice thought. 
that uh, uh, it, it, it is worth something. So it's sort of like a book, right? It's nice to have it on the shelf there and look at it and, and uh, sell it or maybe not sell it, but loan it out to a friend or give it away or something like that. So uh, this old rock and roller, uh, I spent a lot of time going to concerts. I worked at a record store. I thought, what the heck? I'll make a list of all the groups that I've seen live, in concert, over the years. <laughs> There's no way this would be a question on a test. Uh, but um, I have to say, it's kind of impressive. Look at that. Rolling Stones, The Who, Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, U2, Bruce Springsteen, Fleetwood Mac, Pink Floyd. A lot of good stuff. Peter Gabriel. Okay, a lot of, lot of, lot of stuff. And that is how uh, that is how musicians make money is touring. I mentioned that it's really very hard to make any money off of sales or streams, right? You don't make very much off of, off of any of that. And so uh, now with the live concert business at a pause, let's say, it's really hard for musicians to uh, make any money at all. And uh, touring is really how a lot of musicians uh, put uh, uh, food on the table. And these are big, these are big, big groups and, and single acts and all that. And so for mid-range and low-level musicians, it's going to be really, really hard. If it's hard for these guys, then it's going to be really, really hard for just regular. I'm not talking about just bar bands, but just you're trying to break, you're trying to break through. And, uh, and yeah, you get a million streams and, you know, there, a couple thousand dollars. So it's a, it's a rough world uh, for uh, music artists. And I would say anytime you get a chance to, to help them out, to, you know, pay for, a, uh, pay for a download or buy a CD or see them live in concert, then that's a really a good thing. It really, it's a really a good thing. Uh, help the musicians out. Okay. That is it for today, mass media, electronic media, class 10, the recording industry, and some pretty good, uh, some, uh, uh, some pretty good links, I think. And I think the podcasts that go with uh, today's class are pretty good ones, too. And uh, have fun checking out some of the links to YouTube on all this. And in the meantime, I will see you or speak to you next time.